Welcome to Collective. Thank you for tuning in to our video sermons. We hope that this message has blessed you greatly. I started thinking about how we live our days on an average day on a Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. Most of us, we get triggered into this subconscious cycle. Let me explain why. Firstly, the alarm rings and we get shocked. And I snooze. I don't know how many of you snooze your alarm. I snooze not just one time, two times. I snooze at least three times every morning because my zen zen just wakes me up every night. So as a parent, in the morning, it's so hard to get up, so I snooze. Then after that, what do I do? I take out my phone and I go through my WhatsApp. How many of you do that? Then I check, WhatsApp, okay, who texted me? Who's looking for me? Who do I need to get answers immediately? After that, we go through our social media apps, then our news app. We don't have to go through our weather app because our weather is the same every day. <laughs> then we get out of bed on the same side. I get out of bed on the same side because I can't go over the other side. My husband is sleeping the other side. And then we go about our day. And most of the times, our physical bodies have become our mind. And it repeats itself again and again every day. When we go for lunch, we eat the same unhealthy food. The gali min, the jiok fan, the za fan. I don't know what some of you eat. And then we distract ourselves at work in the same ways. So, but remember the days where we live without this thing? I'm not, I think most of you would understand what I'm talking about. When I was uh, in high school, I get dropped off at tuition classes really early because my mom hates that I'm late. So I always have a good 10 minutes before the class starts. And most of the time, because there's no smartphone, all of us with our high school mates, we just chat, we talk, we play, run around and uh, play catch. I don't remember whether we played catch during high school, but, but even if we have nothing to talk about, we would just stare at each other and daydream maybe. And fast forward to this era, when I drop off my son at piano class, he's 12 years old now, and he's been in the same piano class for the last eight years with the same group of friends, okay? But for the last eight years, every time, every Saturday at 12 o'clock when I drop him off, he would just get up there, he would sit next to his friend, they'll give each other a nod, right, Wesley? And then they'll take out their phones or their gadgets and just, they'll just stare at their phone while waiting for the class, sitting next to each other. And it got me thinking, it's like we have managed to get rid of boredom in our lives. There's no such thing as boredom anymore. Every time we feel bored, we take out our phone. We feel socially awkward. What do we do? We don't know what to say. We take out our phone and don't look at me, don't talk to me. And this is how most of us are living in today's heavily stimulated world. We're spending more and more time in subconscious and distracting cycles. More of our time is being taken from us because we've allowed our bodies and our external world to govern our lives. And we're so used to it that we don't realize it. So for the same reason, prayer becomes so difficult because there's so much distraction going on. There's Netflix, there's social media, there's so many things to go through. And we have this preconceived idea that prayer is so hard, sometimes boring, or most of the time boring, but we know as Christians, we need to pray. My Sunday school teacher taught me, read your Bible, pray every day. But most of the time, it doesn't even cross our mind to pray. And not until we come to church, sitting here, and the preacher like me asks you, hey, you got to pray. Then, okay, okay, God, I'll, I'll pray since I'm here, might as well. Okay, I have all this list of things. I want this one, I want that one, this. God, I need this, I need that. Okay, thank you, God. You, you're a good God, right? So give it to me. And we beg God with our list. In Tim Keller, in his book called Prayer, which is this book, um, it's a brilliant book. Uh, George and I base our sermons on this book. You've got to read it. He, he said this, In our natural state, we pray to God to get things. We may believe in God, but our deepest hopes and happiness reside in things as in how successful we are or in our social relationships. We therefore pray mainly when our career or finances are in trouble, or when some relationships or social status is in jeopardy, when life is going smoothly and our truest heart treasures seem safe, it does not occur to us to pray. Also, ordinarily, our prayers are not varied. They consist usually of petitions, occasionally some confession, 
Seldom or never do we spend sustained time adoring and praising God. We have no positive inner desire to pray. We do it only when circumstances force us. Why? We know God is there, but we tend to see Him as a means through which we get things to make us happy. And for most of us, He has not become our happiness. We therefore pray to procure things, not to know Him better. So what is prayer? If prayer is about talking to God, it's about connecting with God, then why do we find it so, so hard to pray? And the best example to learn about prayer is, in fact, the life of Jesus. It wasn't just a message that he preached, but he lived out that life. In between uh, preaching to thousands of people, feeding the multitudes, performing miracles, healing the sick, he always found time to pray in secret. And the Gospels tells us that Jesus prayed at every major event in his life. His baptism, the choice of apostles, his transfiguration before the cross at Gethsemane and on the cross. And even now, the Bible tells us that he continues in prayer for us. Hebrews 7, 25 says, he always lives to make intercession for us. So the funny thing is, Jesus really, really enjoyed praying. And so one of the things that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them was prayer. They have seen him in prayer all the time, so they knew prayer must be something really, really important to him. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it says, One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. So the key to unlock the riches of prayer is actually found in the Lord's prayer. Yet it is an untapped resource because it is so familiar. It is so familiar growing up after memorizing John 3.16, the next thing you memorize is, as a Christian, is the Lord's Prayer. And my parents make me pray that prayer every night before bed. And it's so familiar. It's like, um, familiar, they say familiarity blinds us sometimes. I live in a small town called Tawau, and back then, the old Tawau airport used to be opposite my house. So growing up, for years, day in, day out, I hear the planes landing, I hear the planes taking off, to a point that I actually don't hear them anymore. Until visitors, when they come and visit us, when they hear that sound of the plane landing, they'll be so shocked. They say, wow, you guys live here, it's so loud. And my whole family is like, what? What sound? It's nothing. It's the same. The Lord's Prayer is so familiar. We're like, what? What prayer? We ignore it. Let's read the Lord's Prayer today. Um, there's two versions of it from Luke and Matthew. I want to go through it through Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 13. Let's be a Sunday school this morning, shall we? Okay, let's all read this together. Some of you, I know you have memorized it. It's, you know it by heart. So let's read it out loud together. One, two, go. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil one. Notice that he has two parts to it. The first three petitions are, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. The second three petitions are, give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You can see the difference and feel the difference between these two halves. The first three petitions are about God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will. The last three are about our food, our forgiveness, and our holiness. The first three call our attention to God's greatness, but the last three call attention to our needs. So the two halves are really, really different. The first half feels majestic and lofty and heavenly. And the second half feels mundane, lowly, and just human. So let's begin. When the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, the first thing Jesus did was he said, pray like this, our Father in heaven. So it begins by acknowledging that God is our heavenly Father. So many people think that prayer is actually about us, it's about me. 
But Jesus reminds us that prayer begins with God, His kingdom and His ways. So true prayer is putting God first and seeking His kingdom first and seeking His righteousness. And everything else flows from this foundation. Knowing that God is our Heavenly Father affects how we pray. We're not praying to some abstract being in the universe out there like interstellar that, whoa, turn up when you need it. Or to some angry God who is out to judge you and you're so afraid of this God. But we're praying to our Heavenly Father. And think about that for a minute. He is our loving Father. So the, the, this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, reminds us of who He is and who we are. He's our Father, we are His children. And this is the number one thing you need to know. You need to know who you are praying to because it matters. In John chapter 1, verse 12 to 13, it says, Yet to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Bible says that we are adopted as sons and daughters of God. It now means that God loves us as if we had done all that Jesus had done. And it means that Jesus did not merely pay for the penalty of our sins, but He also positively merited for us the chance to have an intimate and unbreakable relationship with this God of the universe. And that is why we can call upon God as our Heavenly Father. My, my dad... Um, I love my dad. This is a picture of my dad. Look at Zen Zen. He just never follows instruction. So this is my dad. Um, I love him. He, uh, I adore him. He, he loves me and he provides and he always spends time with me. I remember um, growing up, so I'm a typical daddy's girl. Growing up when I was five years old, um, I remember one incident. I always loved to follow my dad out to um, parties or whatever. So he brought me out to a wedding banquet, just him and me. So at the banquet, I was standing up on the banquet chair. It has a high back, right? I was standing there. I, would, I, I can't remember what I was doing. I was already shaking and moving around. Then suddenly, that whole chair fell over bah, onto the floor, onto the cement floor. You can imagine how loud is that, right? The whole restaurant stopped and looked at me. So my dad, he got up, he grabbed me by my arm. You know, when how someone grabs you by the arm, he's really mad. And he walked me out of the restaurant. Everyone was staring at me, feeling sorry for me. He walked me out of the restaurant into the back kitchen, closed the door, but we were not alone. There were chefs trying to get their dinner ready for the wedding guests. And then he stood me there, made me look at him, and gave me my first spank. Bah! I told you how many times not to stand on the chair. Then, the second one, bah! Why did you not listen to me? I'm your dad. Bah! That one. And just now, why didn't you call auntie and uncle when I asked you to? He has to put that in. So, three spanks. And I, I couldn't even cry because I was so shocked and he was so angry. And then he asked me one last thing. Are you going to sit down after this when we go in? I said, yes, I will. So then he gave his hand to me, and I held his hand, and we walked right back into the restaurant. And I felt like a hero. Everybody was staring at me, waiting to see what happened. But that hand gesture shows that my dad loves me no matter what. No matter how naughty I am, how embarrassing I was to him, he has his open arms around me. And that means I always have this access to my dad. It's an unlimited access. It's the same with us and God. We have this access with God, our Heavenly Father. It's an all year round pass, all day, unlimited. So prayer is life with our Heavenly Father. And the end goal of prayer is to have a relationship with Him. I, um, when you need to build a relationship with someone, you need to spend time with that person, right? So um, recently I found that I was a bit busy and I didn't really have time to hang out with my husband. So I decided to pick up running because I know he likes to run, like CK, they always talk about running. So I said, okay, I'll run with you. 
then he was very excited. So we thought, I said, okay, it's our marriage time, okay? We're going to run together so we could spend time together and, and I could build my relationship with you. So every evening, not every other evening, uh, sometimes on a Monday on our day off, so at 6 p.m., we will put on our gear and we are so excited and we hold our hands out, walk out the gate. And then, okay, we'll start our run and he has this watch, he has to tit 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 I don't know, whatever does he have to do. We can't start running until he starts that thing. So once he got that done, and okay, okay, let's go. 5 km today, okay? I said, okay, go. Then we start running. In the beginning, it's okay. We're next to each other. After a while, he just goes on. Like, I can't even see him most of the time. Then I thought, what kind of marriage time is this? Gosh. So most of the time, I end up running alone. And it's five kilometers to last. It's a long way. But I actually end up talking to God a lot. And I realized, gosh. This is brilliant. I have no distractions, no kids calling me, no kids fighting, no responsibilities. I can talk to God. So I began running. Even days that my husband's not running, I decided that I'm going to run because I just want to spend time with him. The more you spend time with God, the more you know him. And you can build a relationship with this God, your heavenly father. Then it says, hallowed be your name. The word hello is seldom used today. It doesn't mean hello, that hello, okay? It's hello, it be your name. It means to make holy. So this, this part of prayer is to glorify God's name through praise and worship. And in other words, prayer is an act of div divine worship and it begins by acknowledging God for who He is and, who, and all His greatness and all His mighty acts. So beginning prayer by offering worship to God helps us keep a proper perspective on prayer. It takes our eyes off of ourselves and back of, to put our focus back onto God. St. Augustine, one of our early church fathers, he said this, when we come to God in prayer, we have to account ourselves as desolate in the world, however great the prosperity of your Lord may be that no, no matter how great our earthly circumstances become, they can never bring us the lasting peace and happiness that are found in Christ. Unless we have that clearly in view, our prayers may go wrong. We have to account ourselves as desolate that we're nothing in this world to put the right perspective towards God again. So when we hallow God's name, we don't make Him holy or good. Is He not holy already? To hallow God's name doesn't merely mean to regard Him as good and holy either because even the demons regarded Him as holy. To hallow God's name means, it simply means something more. It means to love Him, to honour Him, to value Him, and to treasure Him above all else. And this request alone directly targets our heart because only the heart hallows, only the heart treasures, the heart reveres, the heart honours, the heart loves. That's why you, when you, you break up in a relationship, your heart hurts because you love with your heart. So to hallow God's name is not merely to live righteous lives, but to have a heart of grateful joy towards God, for He's holy, He's beautiful, He brings peace, He brings love. And when you love and treasure God in that manner, it reorientates you back to the big picture, and you can't wait to spend time with Him because the whole point of prayer is to be with the Father. Then it says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Now, this was the hardest part for me to, to be able to bring it through to you today. So on Tuesday, I was so stuck. I closed my laptop, I drove home, and I went running again to talk to God about it. And because I had so many questions. When you say your kingdom come, isn't God the king already? Doesn't he rule over all? If his kingdom has already been established, then how can it come? And we are asked to pray, your will be done. What isn't his will done? Isn't God's sovereign will done at all times and all places? Because he's sovereign, he's in control, he knows everything. And in Psalms 103 verse 19, it says that the Lord has established His throne in heaven and His kingdom rules over all. So God's name, God's kingdom, God's will is perfect in the heavenly realms. St. Augustine said this, God is reigning now, but just as a light is absent to those refusing to open their eyes, so it is possible to refuse God's rule. 
That's why we need His kingdom to come because our world is imperfect. There's sin in our world, there's suffering, there's poverty, and it never ends. And God is not unaware of our sufferings because His righteousness is to bring peace to all the earth, but all these things have not been fully fulfilled. So God is still carrying out His plan. He didn't forsake us. It's not like, oh, I've created the universe. It's perfect. Hey, you guys, I'm on a vacation. You're on your own. No, he's, He has not stopped advancing His kingdom to wipe out evil. Therefore, this prayer is a petition that God would continue transforming the world into a place where everyone obeys and loves Him perfectly and joyfully. So there is a sense that His kingdom has not yet been fulfilled. And in other words, you, when you pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, it is saying that our prayer has the potential to make a difference. That our prayer, your prayer, has the potential to make a difference. And you can work in partnership with God. We are also acknowledging that we need to press on, to hold on to God simply because it's not the end yet. The whole deal of redemption is so not, it's not just so that you can go to heaven, I can go to heaven but that the whole world would know Him. Only when we truly and profoundly understand that God is our Father and that we can hallow in His name, extend His kingdom and His will to be done, we're inviting all that God is into all that we are. Only then we're ready to go to the next petition, which is give us this day our daily bread. But most of the time, we start with this one. God, give me this. I need this, I want that, you are good God, you're going to give it to me. And then we'll, around there, we'll thank God for it, oh, thank you, by the way, uh, yeah, you're my father. We go it the other way around. But Jesus taught us that the right way to pray is the, it's the other way, to adore his name, to magnify him. Then, when our heart is right, we are ready to ask for God to give us this day our daily bread. So an important part of prayer is asking God to meet your needs. We should not be afraid to ask God to meet your basic needs. And when you do that, you're acknowledging that He's God over your life, He's in control, and everything that we have comes from Him. But Jesus isn't talking about cars, or material things, a bigger house, but our basic needs, our daily bread. The reason is simple, God knows what we need, not just what we want. My youngest boy, Alexander, is a serious shopaholic. So he doesn't, he loves buying toys. So he doesn't just shop in Toys R Us. He could even shop at 99 Speed Mart. Imagine that. 99 Speed Mart is our convenience store. Um, it has nothing. It's just selling uh, necessities. So I'm, I'm there to buy diapers and milk powder because it's the cheapest there. And then he would run around the corner. He would know where to find the exact toys. He would go there, grab the biggest one he could see, he doesn't care, just grab a big one and said, I need to buy this toy. And he gives this sulky face. Then we'll tell him, no, but Coco has that toy. Everything that Coco has is yours. Coco doesn't want it anymore, it's yours. He said, no, it's Coco's one. I don't have it. I need to buy this toy. It's like a lot of us girls, when we go into Zara, we grab those dresses. I need to buy this dress. I really need to buy this dress. Sometimes my husband will tell me, no, you just want to buy that dress. So we need to distinguish between our wants and our needs. Many times the things that we want are not what we need, and the things that we need are not what we want. Like a child, a child only wants what he sees, a toy. And the parent will go, no, you don't need that toy. You need education. But your, your child will be like, what education? It's the same reverse to God. God, I need this. But to God, it's like, no, you don't need that. You need something else. You need my provision. You need me more than anything else. So this prayer should help us overcome our anxieties about life and the future. Many people live in fear of losing their job, losing their house, losing all they own. But we need to understand that it is God's desire to take care of His children. Philippians 4.19 says, My God will supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So whatever your needs are, don't be afraid to come to God because God will help you with it and He'll hear your prayer. But I know in real life, not all prayers get answered. That's why next week, come back next week, pastor's going to preach on the unanswered prayer. What happens when your prayers go unanswered?
that's next week. So once we got that sorted, our basic needs, then it goes on to say, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgiveness works both ways. If we have not seen our sin and sought radical forgiveness from God, we will not, we'll be unable to forgive and to seek the good of those who have wronged us. It is only when we have experienced that magnitude of His mercy and the, the liberty that it creates within us that we could extend this grace to those who have wronged us. The self-righteous will not think that they require forgiveness, so they begin to judge other people. It, in so many ways, our imperfections are constant reminders that we all need His forgiveness. And when we receive that, we are told to extend it to those around us. The Bible says He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's important to remind ourselves, and this prayer reminds us as well, that forgiveness isn't just for the lost. It's for Christians too. It's for you. It's for me. It's for us every single day. When we pray this prayer, we are not, it doesn't mean that God, I've forgiven others. Now you've got to forgive me. No, it's not. We are not earning forgiveness. But that being forgiven and forgive, to forgive others and being forgiven, it correlates with one another. God wants to bring healing and restoration to broken relationships because ultimately, when there's forgiveness in your heart, it blocks you from connecting with God and it affects the matters of your heart. Only when you release forgiveness, you let go, you let loose, that you could allow God to mend that brokenness in you, that hurt in you. Then lastly, it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus states this pr prayer negatively and positively, if you realize. Negatively, when he says, lead us not into temptation. Positively, deliver us from evil. Now, all pleasures in life is a test from God, laced with temptation from Satan. When we receive a pleasure like a new job, new bonuses, new house, new wife, new healthy baby, Will we idolize this pleasure or we thank God for it and consider Him as more valuable than this pleasure? Two Sundays ago, um, uh, my youngest boy again, Alexander, I have many stories to tell about this Alexander. So he was at church at 9 a.m. like today, 9 a.m. he was here and Pastor Keith's son, Caius, was here as well. That's them. So they were playing happily. Uh, Pastor Keith's son brought along a blue color super wing. Uh, it's blue color, it's a blue color plane. So Zen Zen saw, he said, oh, can I play with that plane? Kaya said, sure. So they were playing happily in the play area outside the glass room. And then it was time to go to the kids' church. So then we said, all right, pack up. We've got to go to kids' church. Then Kaya said, oh, give me back my toy. And Zen Zen said, no. It's my toy. I don't have the blue one. I have the red one, but I don't have the blue one. Then Kaya said, no, it's mine. So Kaya tried to grab it from him. Then they said, no, it's not. I don't have the blue one. I want to play with the blue one. Then Kaya tried to kick him. And then my son, that fist came out. Before I could stop it, it reached Kaya's face. I think Pastor Kip doesn't know about this, okay? I couldn't face him that day. <laughs> So I, when I saw that first punch, I quickly grabbed my son. Zen Zen, you stop this right now. And he wanted to punch me because I, I was trying to grab that toy away from his hand. Pleasures in life. Will we idolize pleasures in life? It's like us adults, right? We want what other people have. Hey, that holiday. Gosh, I gotta want that. Hey, that... That... <laughs> New wife, I want that. Oh. In the same way, all pain in this life is also a test. When you go through a loss, loss of a loved one, loss of a baby, loss of a job, loss of your health, you go through cancer treatment, it's not easy. But when you go through this pain in life, Will you trust God in His infinite wisdom, power, and love to carry you through? Or will you begin to curse God? God, I hate you. You never gave me this. 
you gave it to someone else, but you never gave me this. Why did you let this happen to me? If you love me so much, why do you let it happen to me? Will we trust Him or will we curse Him? So this last petition is asking God to deliver us from the temptation of idolizing pleasures and to deliver us from the pain of suffering. That when we go through suffering, we have the strength to go through it and we won't curse God for it. So the Lord's Prayer is powerful. It's very true to life in this sense. Life is a combination of spectacular things and simple things. In almost everyone's life, there's breathtaking things when you meet God for the first time and boring things like going to work every day. That's the way life is. God made you be a part of hallowing His name, extending His kingdom, seeing His will done on the earth. In other words, He made you for something magnificent and for something, for something mundane. He made you for something spectacular and for something simple. He loves both and He honours both. But what we fail to see often is that when we lose our grip on the greatness of God and His name and His kingdom and His will, we lose this divine balance in life. We become lopsided and we get so consumed and overwhelmed by the problems of the mundane. What we see is just problems after problems, needs after needs. So the power of the Lord's Prayer lies in two distinctions, the magnificent and the mundane. When we can see both, we can better gauge the depth of our lives, both in its temporal and eternal state. But if we only see our problems with the, in the mundane, with our own eyes, with our own lens, and we try to fix our problems with our own mundane strength, you will not be fulfilled. You will never be fulfilled. You will feel like you're being tossed here and there, left, right, center, by one opinion to another. He said this to me. She said this to me. He told me to do this. He told me to do that. When we try to solve our problems from what's below, from knowledge that's from below, you will never get it right. On the other hand, when we put His eternal perspectives, His holiness, His love, His righteousness into the picture, situations will begin to make sense. It will give you a greater and deeper sense of all that you're going through. And you will find strength from above, not from below, but from above to carry you through it. It's what I call the intertwining of the magnificent and the mundane. The unity between God and you. And that is the power of prayer. That you allow God to be a part of your life, to work through you. For, um, for some of you, the mundanes are probably affecting you right now. That's why you struggle to pray because you can't even see that first part of the prayer. How can I tell you, God, that I love you and you are magnificent when I have so many things going on in my life? My physical needs are not met. I have problems with finances, with just making ends meet, relational problems, mental problems. I'm so depressed in my life. Moral problems. At times you feel like, God, why does it feel like I'm such a failure, like I'm such a loser? And, and you feel so alone in this whole journey and you sink further and further and further into hopelessness. But you must always remember that you have a father and his fatherhood means that he cares for you. He cares for every single one of those problems that you have. And He wants you to talk to Him about them in prayer and to come to Him for help because that's what you need. And God knows what you need. He knows what you're going through. And for some of you, you find it hard to embrace God as your Heavenly Father because your father left you when you were young. You were abused or mistreated and your real father never loved you. Your experience with your mundane father has affected how you view that magnificent, magnificent Father. You say, God, how can I see you as my Father when my own Father doesn't even love me? It might take you a while, a longer while, and you might struggle through it, but it's worth that struggle because God knows He wants to be there for you and He wants to build this new relationship with you as your Heavenly Father. If only you would allow Him to do that. So prayer, it's reorientating our life back towards God. That we are not consumed by our own needs, but we look to the Father. 
begin to have a conversation with God. Talk to God. Spend time with Him. Because through conversation with God, you can have an encounter with Him. You can meet God through prayer. And through prayer, you can experience His love. You can feel belonged. You can experience His confidence. He brings joy. He brings peace. Prayer begins by magnifying God for who He is. And prayer ends with a deeper relationship with God, your Heavenly Father. And today, He's inviting you into that space with Him. A lot of us, long-time Christians, sometimes we take it for granted. We, we, we forget who we are. But you must remember, you have God, a Father who loves you. So today, can I invite all of you to stand in this place? Prayer is such a powerful tool that we can have in our life. And it begins with extending ourselves and telling God, God, here I am. I come as I am. I know you are there for me. He's opening his arms wide open, waiting to embrace you for whatever that you're going through. You don't even have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. He's already loved you. So as we sing this song, I think this is a brilliant song. It talks about the Father's heart. Make it your prayer. Every word that you sing, every lyric that you sing from this song, make it a prayer and begin to talk to God. Talk to God and begin to adore Him for who He is in your life. Thank you for watching this sermon. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give online or make a direct transfer to the account below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for messages like this. Have a great day.